This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Bill, and thanks everyone for the invitation to uh, spend the day with you folks here. Unfortunately, I won't be continuing the Alan, Marjorie, and Chris show. I'm not Canadian. <laughs> But being from Boston, I can give you an earful of unrecognizable pronunciations of words. <laughs> While on that, that subject, um, am I in Jets country or Bill's country today? Jets, Giants. All right, I just wanted to stir the pot a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to run through, uh, okay, Bill, I'd like you, I'm, I'm standing between you folks and lunch. I'd rather it be Bill standing between you and lunch, so when 12, am I? 12.30. Okay. I'm going to uh, continue on with a, a few things. Uh, Bill, Bill started uh, family business, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Allen, Michigan State, 1980. I followed you, Ohio State, 1982. We've got a lot of miles on our tread. Uh, but uh, I think uh, everyone here is very energetic, energized, uh, uh, and, and uh, I don't think we need to measure ourselves in terms of years. It's more of the, uh, the energy that, that, that we're all trying to share and, and uh, continue experiencing. All right, reality check, folks. Uh, very shortly, this planet will be inhabited by 9 billion individuals. My question is, how many more until feeding ourselves becomes a problem. I saw a very sobering um, show on TV last week that stated that 50% of the Earth's animal species are gone. And uh, the, the decline is, is going to continue. Um, we're displacing lots of other species. How are we going to feed ourselves? Um, for, for my personal story, uh, I've uh, shifted all of my research activity from three years ago where I was only researching ornamental crops to today where 90% of my research activity is edible crops. And I'll show an aerial photograph of my family's operation in Andover in, in a, a slide or two. Um, the umbrella project that I'm writing and speaking about I've titled From Flowers to Food. And actually, because I grew up on a truck farm as, as a youngster and through high school, uh, it's, it's kind of poetic that it's really not from flowers to food for me. It's a complete closing of a circle. And it, it started as food. We went to flowers when we could not make a living in New England on the farm. And I don't know how, how balanced or appropriate, inappropriate, whatever adjective you want to use that uh, now my family's operation, three years ago we shut the doors after 51 years of, of growing flowers because there wasn't enough margin to keep, um, let's see, two brothers, uh, me, my parents, four households uh, going. So anyway, I'm, I'm very excited about opportunities and I wanna share that excitement with you uh, after a couple of additional sobering Thoughts. Aphids grow wings when they overpopulate host plants and fly to another. We're building rockets today so that when we overpopulate, not if, but when we overpopulate the planet, we can find a new home. A host plant, a host planet, silly me for thinking that we're any smarter than an aphid. So I do believe we're smart enough, uh, but then I turn on the TV and see a show with a couple that has 17 children. And, and you know, what, what, what is this all about? Every one of those souls is precious, but I would look at the parents and say, I don't know, wake up a bit. Um, now, is our industrial model of agriculture sustainable? We came back from World War II and applied an industrial model to our agricultural system uh, because it worked so well uh, to get us through the war. And it has served us well in agriculture for two or three generations. Many of us in this room will now look at California, Arizona agriculture and, and, and say, is, is it sustainable? Is it going to be the answer for us? I want to continue 
uh, as seamlessly as I can with Chris is Chris's final uh, slide with the uh, uptick in locally grown and whether it's cut flowers or I'm going to be talking about vegetable production uh, specifically I'll, I'll talk about root crops in plug trays for any of us that have been growing flower plugs and ornamentals for most of our careers I've got some real cool pictures to share with you of radishes, beets, and carrots, and how we might be able to uh, hit the lo locally grown food movement with some of our expertise. Can we return agriculture to the family farm? This is a farmer's market in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And what I found very interesting with this, I'm guessing, uh, well, that's, that's a matriarch uh, that, uh, is a, a, a linchpin, a, a backbone of our greenhouse industry. I've got my mom that's uh, uh, been the central key point, the glue that holds things together. I know any other person in this audience that is on a family-run operation, you know this position that I'm describing. I don't know, I didn't talk to this group to, to decide whether or learn whether it's her daughter and son-in-law or her son and daughter-in-law but there's the second generation. And then so cool that we've got that third generation uh, waiting in the wings to continue this family farm approach. Here's a grower uh, less than an hour from me in, uh, in Eastern Massachusetts, a multi-generational family farm. Uh, you can look out the, uh, the glass glazing of the sidewall of the greenhouse and see traditional outdoor row crop agriculture. Now this family operation is, is an integrated horticultural establishment today where they grew up on the farm, had a farm stand, built greenhouses, uh, got involved and diversified into flowers along with the farm. And what's really cool here, I stood in there and, and I, I saw it at, at this point what I determine was the future of some of our agriculture. These are baby greens being broadcast sown in rows in open 1020 trays on a flood and drain or ebb and flood bench. And they were harvesting this, uh, this crop in three weeks from sow to harvest. And they had the farm stand right there on site. So that was really cool for me to see the, the past or the traditional agriculture with, with the future. Few questions. Would we be healthier eating less but higher quality food? What did high fructose corn syrup accomplish? Isn't it nice to see some of the manufacturers now listening and getting away from that input? And why does our food have to be so cheap? Uh, I it was this past Sunday I saw one of the early morning uh, news programs. And there was a segment, and I don't have the name of it right, but it was, it was about the movement to pay migrant farm workers a more fair wage. And how uh, the, the movement hit its head against the wall for many years, going to the grocery stores saying, we need you to pay a little more for the produce so that we can pay the, the pickers. And it wasn't until they bypassed distribution and went right to the consumer that they got the necessary momentum. And it's it, the program, something like fair, fair food or, or something. But it struck me because I, I have a real issue with why in the United States our food has to be so cheap. And why as growers, we, it, it's all about what cost can we take out versus what quality can we put in. So the locally grown food movement with all these participants increasing, I think that's really cool. Now I'm going to toggle back and forth uh, between a farmer's market in Boulder, Colorado that I visited last year and took some really neat pictures. I'm going to ask you to from time to time, squint your eyes. I'm going to show you some really nice produce in the stalls and stands of the farmer's market. And then I'm going to toggle back to my research greenhouse and activities and in the end say, is there a difference between the pictures that we're looking at? 
This is that aerial op, uh, view of the family operation in Massachusetts, uh, 55,000 square feet. Down the, off, off the uh, uh, slide, uh, when I grew up before this land was sold to settle my grandfather's estate, uh, we had about 10 acres of uh, land that we cultivated and uh, we trucked our produce into Boston. If any of you have been in the Faneuil Hall tourist area of, of Boston, uh, before converting it to a tourist uh, location. I, I have memories of driving in uh, with my dad in the pickup truck loaded with the uh, produce right to those buildings and unloading in the stall where, where a commission agent would then sell the produce. Um, so at, at this point, we've shut down the family operation. One of my brothers is running a few houses for flower production to complement his landscaping activities. And I've taken over one house, a 25 by 100 foot house for, for my uh, research projects. Inside this house uh, today is uh, completely re retooled for um, greenhouse hydroponic uh, vegetable and herb production, nutrient film channels, flood and drain benches. Uh, now this is a 72 plug, plug tray of uh, radishes and um, Marjorie, Alan, any of us in research, we look back on your careers and you, we're lucky if we have, you know, a, a handful of, uh, of uh, pictures that we call winners um, and, and money shots. And uh, this one, as a matter of fact, is about 20 years old. So before I ever thought of researching radishes, you know the saying, you, you take the boy off the farm, but you don't take the farm out of the boy. For years, I had a corner of a greenhouse that I would grow fresh vegetables for, for just my family's consumption. And as I was the one doing the sowing and, and plug producing on our operation, uh, it, it didn't take long to use my imagination and start growing some radishes. So, so that, that is an old picture. And uh, what I found really interesting is uh, I'm going to show you a few more pictures from this past year where I'm digging into the research side of this a little bit more. Let's toggle back to Boulder for a moment. Look at all those root crops, ladies and gentlemen, from the, the, the turnips, beets, the carrots, the colors, the freshness, the farmer's market, locally grown food. This whole thing I find very exciting. I find uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to research the, in this area, travel around the country and learn and learn as much as I can about the, uh, our, our young generation of consumers that is telling us they want locally grown food. They're also telling us that they'd like to eat seasonally. And I describe my generation as being spoiled. We're the grocery store supermarket generation where over our lives, wasn't it so cool that any day of the year we could go to the grocery store and get anything from any place on the planet? And now our children are saying that's, that's not sustainable. Alan, you've referenced your daughter often in your presentation. Uh, our children are probably of similar ages and I'm crediting them when I'm with them saying, you guys are fueling this. You're going to change the way we feed ourselves. This is a picture of a, a, a crop of radishes that I grew last year. The long icicle shape, look at the different colors. And oh, by the way, that's a carrot shaped like a radish. So one of my messages for fellow growers in the audience is, guys, this is only how far will our imagination take us? Alan did a great job talking about breeding and, and the opportunities that are just there. And uh, there's a project, I have a second project uh, looking at LED lighting and indoor warehouse food production. And in my opinion, the breeding efforts, the cultivars that we need for those production systems are right around the corner waiting for us. This is a five inch deep nursery plug tray. Okay, let's grow, let's get going. We can grow some carrots, we can grow some beets. Uh, this is a, uh, the Nantes type uh, carrot with that wide shoulder. This is a 50 plug tray with the five inch deep um, 
uh, you know, intended for nursery stock. And that, that's, a, that's a pretty cool crop. Now, cultivar selection is important. So most of the cultivars that I'm showing pictures of today, when I was selecting them in seed catalogs, they were always described with the words miniature, uh, fast crop. Uh, you, know, you don't want to try and grow an eight inch long carrot in a five inch deep plug tray. But how cool some of these, the, this was a uh, trial with uh, two different cultivars and, and uh, how cool, we, we match up the, the cultivar with the plug tray and, and we're good to go. Here's a, a turnip and I have this picture to illustrate the following. I want you to call your attention to the external root mat from that plug tray. Now anyone in this room who's grown ornamental crop plugs we do, we go out of our way to make sure that doesn't happen. We don't want roots external to the plug tray. I found after one round of work, that's exactly what I do want in this crop. So we have to turn what we've learned on its ear from time to time. And here's where I see production of this group of crops going. I'd like to see a new plug tray designed with, instead of maximum cell volume that we want for petunias and geranium plugs, I'd like minimum cell volume. The growing medium, in my opinion, in this system is only to support the seed and allow it to germinate. Once the root gets down to the flood and drain environment, this interface is where all the action is. So I see uh, new plug trays designed for this type of, of uh, food crop production where much significantly less growing mix will go into the plug tray because we only need that root to get down to the uh, outside. A uh, couple of slides showing how cultivars are different. This is a miniature white turnip and it was very easy to harvest with two fingers just pulling it and that uh, fairly weak tap root would slide right out of the ground. Its mate, a red turnip, was much different where it sat deeper in the, um, the growing mix and you'd need two hands to remove the roots from that turnip. So there's an opportunity for us and plant breeders to de develop cultivars that will sit on top of the mix for harvesting purposes. And I always like to show slides where uh, we, we can say, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to grow plants and it's fun to work with plants for a living. Um, harvest size, maturity, we, we certainly need to match those things up depending on the density of the, the uh, cell and how many you're trying to grow in a square foot versus how long are we going to grow them. And uh, we can get real cute with this, trying to fit round pegs in square holes. Uh, two hands weren't enough to get that out. I needed a jackhammer. Uh, let's go to radishes for a few slides set. And uh, this, this research, uh, this experiment was looking at density and, and, uh, and yield. So I had on the left a 72 plug tray, a 105 and a 128. And after growing to maturity, I removed the tops of the plants to take this picture, the 72 plug tray, the 105, the 128, and then went a step further, harvested, weighed, did all that. Uh, so the uh, left-hand row is the 72, 105, 128, if I'm not going too quickly. Uh, the bottom row is what we'd say is acceptable market size. The largest ones then in the middle is an intermediate, medium-sized radish, and then some pea-sized small radishes up above. So as we would predict, the, the larger cell size, the 72 tray, produced the highest proportion of large radishes to small. And as we got into a tighter configuration with 128, uh, we had more of the medium and small. Okay, blah, 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 what, what's it all mean? I brought those home and took the marketable ones and sliced them as you and I do for our salads. And instead of saying these are not marketable, the medium and small size, I started uh, imagining, well, with a smaller size radish, we don't have to slice it. 
probably get our fingers before we get the slices of the radish, but we might just cut it in half and sprinkle it on the salad. And then instead of throwing out these pea size, they were actually the size of green olives. So I got to thinking, this happened to be after a couple of homebrewed beers that afternoon. <laughs> and by the way, my garden, Alan, I used to have a 25 by 30 vegetable garden off the end of my house. I started home brewing beer about eight years ago. It didn't take two years for the vegetables to go and the hops to, to <laughs> so I've, I've got a wall of hops the size of this screen screaming to be harvested in the next uh, day or two. Anyways, the, the, this uh, imagination, why, why can't we grow a radish that doesn't need to be sliced and sprinkled like a green olive? The only downside I see is an oil-based uh, salad dressing. Some of these, trying to stab them with a fork, might end up on, what movie was that, where it, it ended up on a, a neighbor's plate? All right, this is a 288 plug tray of radish. Uh, just to see how far the envelope can be pushed. And it's almost blurring a line between being a sprout or being a radish. So I'm going to do some work, uh, continue there and see where it leads. I think some, uh, some, some uh, growth regulation, uh, I'm, I'm dying to look at some Florel work on, on systems like this. Um, from years ago, I've, I've uh, had slides of geranium cuttings where it appeared that they were rooted more heavily after floral treatment on a stock plant or in a plug tray. And uh, my reasoning back then was uh, we're, we're encouraging vegetative growth and the root is a vegetative organ. So I wanna take that little concept and see if it will translate and, uh, and, and produce a uniform radish with a smaller top. Now, this is dangerous before lunch but your conference organizers asked me to put a little economics into this presentation. So I'm gonna go through about five minutes and give you uh, my, my take, which is a bit untraditional on how we look at some of our production costs. But just bear with me for a, for a few slides. Uh, this is on the handout for those of you that might wanna take these tables home with you. First, we want to handle a, a discussion of overhead costs and the left-hand column is a traditional dollars per square foot per week as, as a means of describing overhead cost. The column I added next to it is multiplying that per square foot per week out by 52 weeks. Just to get an idea, just to get, wrap our arms around how much is it costing for us to remember the title of, of this presentation is From Flowers to Food. So my premise is that many of us in the audience are currently growing ornamental crops. Some of us might not be satisfied with the money we're making on flowers, and we might be looking at a corner of a greenhouse, a bay of a range, a section of the operation to convert from flowers to food. So I thought it would be good to, to go through some traditional cost analysis in the end we're going to be faced with saying, uh, okay, I can make more per square foot growing flowers, so that's what I'll grow, or I can make more per square foot growing vegetables, that's what I'm going to do in those square feet. So the following columns are taking square foot per week and converting it to a 1020 tray. So a 1020 tray is 1 1.6 square feet, and that's what I'm going to do in these columns. Then we're going to look at various crop cycles just to fill things in a bit. So as an example, a very a fairly common square foot per week overhead cost is 25 cents. And if we look at 25 cents in a 1020 tray for a three week crop cycle, it would be $1.20 for your overhead cost. Are we okay there? I'll, I'll, if we go to four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Now, what, what do these cycles be, uh, match up with? For vegetable crops, this would be baby greens, radish, four weeks, turnip, more like six weeks, carrots, eight weeks. All right, so just for us to wrap our arms around it, I'm not asking you to uh, memorize or, or, or you know, just, just for a, an introductory conversation. 
So I'm going to concentrate on the column for radish just for uh, simplicity today and we'll come back to that in a moment. So you've got that table, you can do whatever you want with it. Variable cost per tray, 72 tray, 128, 288, again looking at this radish example that I'm, I'm running through. Uh, catalog tray price is very similar for these three different trays. I'm assuming we can use a tray for four crops with some sanitizing in between crops. So that brings that variable cost down into the 40 cent range. Then we look at the growing medium, which I assume is fairly similar because the 72 cell is a larger cell, but fewer cells, right? We start adding cells, but the cell size decreases. So it kind of comes out in the wash. And uh, you follow that uh, argument through um, the tray in the media, 75, 80 cents per tray. And then the one that does change is the, as a variable cost is the cost of the radish seed. So when we go from 72 seeds up to 288 seeds, then we've got more money that we're putting into that tray. So add all those things up folks and we're looking at somewhere under or over a dollar. Right, in other words, round numbers, this is very chunky, big chunk uh, cost analysis. Now this, this one, this part I, I want to, well, many of us as small growers are guilty of not factoring into our cost analyses, our salaries. Many small operations wait till the end of the season and whatever's left in their pocket ends up being his or her salary as, as the small business owner. So I want to kind of play on that off of that a bit and I'm going to approach this differently. So I'm going to, to say how much of the greenhouse range am I considering shifting over to food crops? And once I decide how much room I have, how much money do I want left in my pocket at the end of the year? All right, so if I'm balancing whether to go geraniums or radishes, for me to change from geraniums to radishes, it's got to put more money in my pocket. So the, the, the way I'm, I'm going through this, this little uh, table is, for instance, if I'm going to put 10,000 square feet or a quarter of an acre into radish production, and, and please with me, I'm saying radishes, but I'm meaning anything edible, okay? If I want to make $25,000 off of that 10,000 square feet, my overhead cost is going to go up by a nickel a square foot per week. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm factoring in my salary. What do I want my salary to be to justify going into the vegetable crops? If I want to make $50,000 naturally, it's going to contribute more to the overhead cost. And then if I fill things in a little bit, the more space I want to put into vegetable crops, the lower that overhead cost becomes. If I want to make a lot of money, I'm probably going to want to put a lot of space into production. All right, enough. Back to this slide. Let's now zero in on and finish this little thread talking about radishes, starting with that common 25 cent overhead. Now, if, if on the previous slide I said I want to make $25,000, 10,000 square feet, it contributes a nickel. That nickel of overhead per square foot per week will translate into 30 cents per tray. All right, and, and I know this is dangerous right before lunch going, going through this. I'm glad the lights are up. Shift gears now. I went into the grocery store. This, this, well, I took a morning. This was fun. This was good research. Um, I went to Walmart. I, I never go to Walmart. I, I, Walmart is the evil empire for me. That's, you I, don't know how to spell it either. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody hear that? <laughs> All right, no spell check on this guy. So Walmart, uh, my local regional store is called Market Basket, and then I went in Whole Foods. 
So as expected, uh, Whole Foods was the highest bunch of radishes, $2 for the bunch. There were only nine radishes, but it was organic. Uh, the, the Walmart, 94 cents, the cheapest. There were 12 radishes in the bunch. At my uh, local chain, uh, this was the bag of radishes without the greens that you're familiar with. 23 in there, say two dozen. And they also had the live bunch with greens, 99 cents, blah, blah, blah. All right, so they need, not really interesting to you, but you know, I weighed the fresh weight, clean the tops off, weight per radish, all that stuff. But, but the point that I want to bring out here is, is this range of retail costs. And from this range, I chose $1.49 as the retail price that I'm going to use in the analysis. Next step, um, I'm assuming that we have 85% yield in these various plug trays. So in a 72 tray, 85% uh, yield will give us five bunches of a dozen each. If we're selling at $1.49, the revenue is $7.60, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this slide kind of summarizes it. The overhead cost that I was zeroing in on ranged from $1.60 to $2.24. The variable cost, uh, the total production cost, $2.48 to $3.37. And again, this, this big chunky cost analysis, the potential revenue, $7.60 to $10.13 from the previous slide. So, so it, it's more of a proof of concept, folks. Does it even make sense to do this? We know we can grow them but is it going to make money for us to, to shift? And, and, and this, this first time through with these numbers, the revenue is higher than the cost by enough that I wanna keep pushing the pencil, right? So, so I think my first year in this project was proof of concept in terms of the production of the crop. Once we determine that it's only our imagination, we can grow anything we want, in a hydroponic environment. Then we, we pressed on the uh, economics a little bit and, and the numbers at least right now are, th are there. So, so I think that we're going to be in, in good shape. We much mentioned local adult, I mean young adults asking for locally grown food. They want to eat what's in season. This is key. So far this generation is willing to pay a premium. And uh, I, I want to keep them away from Walmart and not poison them with this cheap is best. Uh, they're saying that uh, my earlier question, would we be healthier eating less but higher quality food? Uh, they're saying yes, yes, we want that. Here is that Boulder Farmer's Market showing the diversity in tomatoes. This slide really intrigued me because the cut flowers in the lower right are showing us this diversified horticulture where we've got floriculture in with the food production. And the, what struck me is the interaction, the intimacy of the farmer to consumer relationship. And that's something that we don't have in a supermarket or grocery store. Any of us in garden centering, we've always held, hung our hats on quality and service the service part being um, that, that, that intimacy with our, with our customer. Alan, kudos for the app and bringing more education to this whole table so that we can all uh, do a better job. As with flowers, folks, anchor in specialty items, particularly local populations, ec ethnic uh, preferences. Breeding is going to bring all kinds of opportunities when bright lights, uh, Swiss chard was uh, released years ago. It blurred the line between the flower garden and the vegetable garden. Um, we've, we've talked today about the deck becoming the garden and it's going to be blurred lines between food crops and ornamentals. We have carrots shaped like radish, beets shaped like carrots. It's like whatever we ask plant breeders to give us, they will and I find that very exciting. Here is pak choy in, in uh, an ebb and flood uh, environment. Um, the, the deep nursery tray at harvest, 
Uh, this slide if, uh, in particular illustrates the cultivar selection part of this process. So in a, in a high density planting, we want to go more for the smaller compact uh, miniature uh, cultivars so that we can avoid the diseases and avoid the uh, missteps in production. Uh, we can also force these into a, this is a 50 cell tray grown more as a baby green. And you've seen that product in the grocery store. Uh, this is a, a pristine glacial lake in Colorado. Unfortunately, I use it to, uh, to, to make a couple of comments about fresh water. And I think in our lifetimes, we're going to see that wars will not be fought over fuel, fossil fuels. Wars will be fought over water. Uh, I think we're already witnessing this in the state of California, where the battle is between municipalities and agriculture. And if I were to put my money on who's going to win, I think it's going to be municipalities. So we need to figure this out, and we need to do it quickly. I think I'm going to uh, skip through. Final question. Can we return all of our agriculture to the local level? My opinion, no. We can't. We can't completely displace industrialized agriculture. There's, I don't think there's enough room to do all of this. But I do see a significant portion of agriculture being returned to its local roots. And with this field of celery that I stood at in uh, Southern California, I brought that feeling home and did some work with celery this past season, looking at an 1801 cell, a 37, and a 72. And what was really cool about this, 80 days after plant, these three plants look very similar in that hydroponic environment where you can, you can see where we don't need all that growing medium anymore if we're delivering the nutrients in that irrigation stream uh, at a more, a more frequent um, uh, cycling. And then at harvest, uh, brought those home on the, on the breadboard. And, and again, the imagination, squinting our eyes, can we, can we adapt? and not have to have a huge stock or plant of celery that we're currently buying in the supermarket. Can we buy smaller stocks of celery that will allow me to grow it in a shorter crop cycle so that I can make a living growing celery for the local um, uh, market? I'll close with this. Uh, in my experience, if I talk carrots and celery, when I'm buying them in my local grocery store, I've learned the hard way less than half the time when I come home that celery is tender and sweet. Less than half the time. The other times it's bitter, rubbery. Same for carrots. Sweet, tender. We, we can do all that, we can control all of that, in the systems that we're discussing today. So I think the quality part of it, and if, if our youngsters continue to say, I'll give you an extra nickel for that so that I can make a living doing it, then I think everything becomes more fair. Everything is going to work out. I think that's going to be it. I ended with tomatoes. So many of us talk tomatoes today. Thank you very much for the invitation. has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.